black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Uh, see ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Uh, actually, sitting here with Woody. How are you, Woody? I'm doing pretty well, man. Doing pretty well. Uh, it's always nice to join the show uh, and nice to talk to you, too. Actually, you and I haven't uh, hung out very much lately, so it's nice to see you. Yeah, no, it's good to see you. And I know um, we're going to be having Russell coming on here in a moment to uh, Russell Accord from the International Bigfoot Conference. And if you're out there and you're listening, definitely go to the internationalbigfootconference.com and get your tickets. It's August 31st, September 1st, and 2nd. And I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. And like you and I were talking earlier, it's such a good time. I mean, just talking to the different people and, and the stories, uh, sharing different stories, I'm sorry. And and uh, the children, we talked a little bit about the children. It was, it's a really good time overall. It really is. Yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to it. Let's uh, bring, and I'm looking forward to kicking your butt in mm-hmm. poker too as well yeah, i've had it bro <laughs> <laughs> and we joke about the poker thing if you're a new listener um at the international bigfoot conference uh, russell's nice enough to set us up with a huge room there's a bar and uh, we play poker it was a blast absolute blast uh let's jump into it though tonight let's um russell welcome to the show thank you for being here hey thank you thanks for having me yeah, and no, I appreciate you being here. I know Woody and I were just sitting here talking about the International Bigfoot Conference, and I know it's August, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong on this, Russell, uh, August 31st, September 1st, and 2nd in Kennewick, Washington. That is correct, yeah. And I know we had a blast last year, didn't we, Woody? Oh, it was a little good. Yeah, it was, it was good times. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoyed beating at poker uh, the yeah, last right. time we were there, and uh, everybody else that was there, too. So, no, it was a good time. It was a good time. <laughs> No, it was it was awesome. And seeing all the speakers and just kind of hanging out with the vendors and all the people that come to it. You know, Woody and I went to, um, what was that, Sasquatch Summit? Um, Squatch Fest. Squatch Fest. Squatch Fest, yeah. 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 And, and that was good. I mean, they did a good job putting it on. I, it's no International Bigfoot Conference, but they did a good job putting it on. I, it was a little bit packed, a little, little bit too much going on there. Yeah. But uh, what do you have going on for the International Bigfoot Conference, Russell? What do you have coming up? What speakers and... Anything new this year? Yeah, actually, this year's I kind of changed the format a little bit. It's been um, you guys have to admit when you go to a conference and you have one person go up and sit, stand at the podium and give his presentation, and then the next guy comes up and and uh, when they follow each other, I want to find a way to captivate the audience attention and make it you know visually exciting and kind of fun. Now, everything that we seem to be chasing after is the is Bigfoot-related material, and I thought, what better way to do it than do a film festival? So you've got some of the researchers in the industry that are really great researchers that also do film work. You've got uh, Lyle Blackburn. did a, he's, he's got some films that are just really exciting and fun to watch, and, it's, as, and he's fun to talk to, and he's a blast, but up on the stage... Um, you can't really, you don't really connect with him on a personal level. Whereas his documentaries, you feel like you're speaking to him and you're watching him in the field and 
and visually it's very it's a lot of fun you know so um lyle blackburn is going to bring a film that is related to the subject matter and uh seth breedlove is bringing something that nobody's seen before he's bringing something in off the straight off the press for us we're going to be the first ones to see it um stacy brown is also a filmmaker he's got a film uh, that deals with this skunk ape in Florida. And I've seen some of the parts of his film that he's putting together. He's going to be an up-and-comer. He's he's hungry for the industry, and he's, you know, really chasing after it in a pretty strong way. So he's his material, his his documentary, and the, the interviews that he did are, are pretty dang good. Same with same with Seth and, and Lyle. These guys are all just uh, really great artists in their field. Um, I also have uh, Mike and Mike from uh, the Ohio uh, Night Stalkers. These guys are, um, they've been on TV, they've, they've had some pretty great exposure, but um, they have some audio that was gone through and listened to by David Ellis, and he's got some pretty compelling dialogue about it. It's pretty exciting stuff that some of the material that Mike and Mike have, and their presentation is good. So they're coming out from Ohio. Bill Co. Productions. Um, don't know if you've heard it. Bill and Amy Lancaster. They did a a big um, documentary, more of a um, in interviewing the people that do Bigfoot research, and it's getting to know the researchers. So he, they have a thing called Cultured Bigfoot, and I've seen that. It's a chance to to meet the filmmakers. It's a chance to see what they uh, are bringing. Um, yeah, and, and then, Bill did a good job with that. Yeah, he sent me a copy of that cultured Bigfoot. It was actually pretty. I was like, yeah, a video about Bigfoot researchers. All right, I'll tell you, you know, and kind of drug my feet on it. And I watched, he did a really good job with it, man. It was actually really, really good. Yeah, it was very well yeah. put together. It keeps you engaged. I mean, you, you yeah. it's interesting. And I and I've been I, I I've been a speaker at these conferences and. What I and I don't have anything super exciting. All I have is just the fact that I've done research and I've been out in the field with some of the best of them. And you know, you hear sounds and and you see impressions in the dirt. But um, I'm not going to come to the stage and try to get a, a crowd excited about something that might or might not be. If I'm if I'm going to give a presentation, it's going to be I, I only tell what I know and what I can prove, and nothing beyond that. So when I'm giving a presentation i look at the back of the audience and i see who's nodding off and i'm thinking okay i'm losing them i gotta stop talking and i don't ever want anybody to feel to to put up with one of my conference or one of my presentations so bringing good dynamic speakers is the best way to do it having them present films is going to be really exciting so it's going to be a good year yeah it sounds like it you know you get a chance to meet some of the researchers and investigators and then on top of that the the films and um, for people who are into poker, you can watch me just slaughter Woody in poker. Um, good you food, good drinks. From me yet. What's that? What? You've not sat across from me yet, Wes. <laughs> you had your chance. Well, you haven't even stepped in the room yet. We, we saw you. Yeah, he didn't even get in the ring, man. <laughs> You're like, peace out to this guy. Yeah, I know. Who's this guy? You know what I mean? What's he talking you know, the about? weird thing about that is I had a conference to run, but this year mm, I right. actually started the dinners a little earlier so that I can make time for myself because... I, I know that whatever the stakes are, they, they, I, I'm going to quiet you down and take your money from you, Wes. And Woody's going to have a good laugh when I take your money because <laughs> Woody's not going to take it, that's for sure. And then oh, wow. I'll just have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad we're recording this. I'm going to play this back at a, at, a, at a future date, uh, Russell. Okay, that's, that's fine. <laughs> I, I, you know, if, if I don't take your money, I will not take any calls from you after this conference. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, it's good times. I can't wait. I had a blast last year, and it's just the whole venue. I mean, Woody and I were talking about this. Just the whole venue. You don't really have to. It's not like you have to drive anywhere. You can stay right there at the Expo Center. Beautiful hotel. Absolutely, absolutely beautiful hotel. Mm. Come downstairs. There's a bar downstairs. I know Woody likes to drink, so, you know, we got to have a bar there. Wow, I, I haven't shown up for <laughs> forever that I show up and I, I, I take a beating here. Uh, but, uh, no, you're all right. It, yeah. it's, it's awesome. It's an awesome event. <laughs> and uh, it, it is. You know, it, it's top top of the line. And, and I'm, I really hope the listeners out there go to the internationalbigfootconference.com and get your tickets. And it's what... Um, uh, August 31st, September 1st, and September 2nd. It's a blast. Please come out. Have a great time. And 
Uh, and Bob's going to be there, isn't he? Yeah, I was. I was going to say, I, if I get off this interview without mentioning the rest of the speakers, I'm going to. Oh no! Uh, go ahead. I'll probably. give you the floor. Uh, the I, I definitely Bob Gimlin, um, the legendary Bob Gimlin from the 1967 film, is actually co-hosting this conference. He's not just going to be a speaker and a part of it. He's co-hosting it. This is half his. Um, I brought him in as a partner because we're doing a lot of work together. It just seemed to make sense. It kind of goes hand in hand. And he's he's brought some great ideas, and uh, we'll get to reveal some of that a little later on. Bob's going to be a lot of fun at this conference. Um, we're doing a we're doing a um, a little picnic, not a picnic. Gosh, I shouldn't. That was just really minimizing it. We're doing a little camp out uh, for a couple of days over the summer, and we've got Gary, the camera guy, for our. See, I have a film business that I do where Gary Hansen and myself are actually partnered up. We have quarter 13 pictures, and we're doing Bob's film. And um, we're going to bring that camera to this camp out for a couple days, and we're going to do nothing but film Bob interacting with his friends and being in the woods and at the campfire and eating and, and just being Bob. So one of the things that we're doing at this event is we have VIP dinners. And those are both Friday night and Saturday night. So you can get one or the other, or, or if you're tenacious, you can get both. Um, but there'll be, there's only 70 tickets allowed for Friday night, 70 tickets allowed for Saturday night. And during that dinner, which is steak and vegetables, it's a really good dinner. Um, you're going to get a, your a opportunity to watch that film um, during dinner. And it's not interviewing anyone. I don't want people interviewing or anything else. It's simply visual and music, and it's just fading in and out of Bob being Bob. And um, everybody that's at that dinner will get a copy of that DVD as well for the VIP people. So it's just something to think about. I also have Adam Davis. If you don't know who Adam Davis is, um, world-renowned researcher. He's just been all over the place, and I'm doing a documentary on him as well. I've got everything filmed already. We've got the audio cut out. We're starting to add pictures and uh, um, music to his thing. That will certainly be available at the conference as well, but um, Adam needs a little bit more exposure than what he's got, because if, if you know Adam, you know he's got a, a, a toolbox full of experience. He's just amazing. Some of the things that he's done and seen is just uh, dynamic, really great. Uh, Ken Gearhart is coming. So we got Bob, Adam, uh, Lyle Blackburn. We have Ken Gearhart is coming. Seth Breedlove is going to be showing his film. Stacy Brown Jr. showing his film. Mike and Mike. Um, I have J.C. Williams. A lot of people don't know a lot about J.C. Williams. He is a diehard researcher. Ex-military, has no problem being in the woods for a month, two months at a time. And he's very thorough, very decisive and, and great investigator. Um, he was born in Northern California and he's, um, his presentation is literally, I, you probably all heard of the, the Freeman footage out of uh, Walla Walla Blues Mountain area. Well, when uh, we get to see J.C. Williams hit the stage, he will have just come back from 30 days uh, of being in that area. And he's going to bring to us all of his findings and everything that he's done. He's got some stuff that he wants to talk about anyway, but you're talking real time, hot off the press, the latest and greatest. And he's up in that area where there's been a tremendous amount of activity. So he's going to be something you won't want to miss, um, his presentation. But we've broken it up with a lot of film, a lot of presentation, a lot of new faces. I have a couple surprises that I believe I'm, I'm waiting for final resolution on them. Um, as for some people, it's a matter of uh, agreeing on a price, but I have a couple more. Uh, well, people let's, that let's talk about that. Well, who are they? Oh, see, if I say it, I'm, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Trying to get was, you to walk into the fire here. Yeah, dang good try, though. Spill it. <laughs> no, if, if I Spill say it. it and they don't show up, then I've, then I've done myself yeah. a great disappointment. No, I it's hear better it. as a surprise than a disappointment. Of course, of course, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like when I take your money, it'll be a surprise <laughs> and, and a disappointment. Wow, um, man, this is going to feel but, good. Um, Somebody had their I, Wheaties this morning. Right? I did. It was, it, I had put sugar on it, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, There's a lot, of, a lot of good things that are going to happen at this conference. It's going to be um, just a lot of fun. Good people come in, good movies. All these people that are showing films will also have films that they're, they'll be um, making available. So what better place to come, meet a filmmaker, 
see his film and get an autograph on it and purchase that and have it for your own. Yeah, it sounds like a blast. I mean, every year that we've gone, it's been a complete blast. I mean, I, I've, I've never go, left the international. Man, my mic's loud. I've never left. I'm running a real professional operation here. <laughs> uh, I've never left the uh, International Bigfoot Conference and thought, oh, what a waste of time or what a waste of a weekend. Or I've always, every time we've left, even Woody and I have talked on the way out, we're like, man, that was awesome. That was so cool meeting all those people, hanging out, talking about Bigfoot. You know, it's. Doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. For you, Wes, I mean, are you, would you guys consider doing a, uh, you, I think you did a live cast, podcast from there at, on the site. Are you considering mm-hmm. doing something like that this year? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think that we did three shows. Great. Didn't yeah. we do three shows from there last year? I think so. I think it was three shows. It was yeah. two or three shows we did live right from the. Right on site. Yeah, yeah, right on site, man. That was cool. It was. Now, do you want me to place you, your table, at the same place you were last year? Did that work for you? You can place me wherever you want, Russell. I'll be happy to come. Just show up wherever you wherever you put me. So we're, whatever works for you is good with me, man. I'll be delighted to have you. It would be great to, to have you there. So, I mean, even for the viewers or the people that are listening to this um, broadcast, um, there's your chance to come and meet Wes and Woody and, and kind of see a, a great crowd, some good films and it's just going to be a lot of fun. You you won't walk away being disappointed. Um, Wes, the only thing that you're going to do is you're going to be excited. You'll be happy that you came, all that. The only thing you're going to do is, is say, you know, if I hadn't have played those pocket jacks, I'd still have my money. <laughs> well, if I'm being honest, there's been several times where I thought I well, should have never played those pocket jacks. <laughs> you got you got to watch out for his ace king. That, that's, yeah. that's where it's at. Yeah. Anytime he's got ace king. in trouble every time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm just waiting for you to show up, Russell. Yeah, I, mean, I know. He talks a I big mean, game. We talk a whole bunch of poker, and you poke your face in and say, hi, guys, and then you're, and then you're gone. So I'm going to hold you to it this time. Yeah, you know what? I What what night would you like me? I bet. Well, I'll I beat you I both nights, whatever night Saturday you want. Night, because if you're, you'll are you still have money Friday night, but I'll finish <laughs> Probably you up not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, whatever night works, man. I, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm pumped. I'm excited. I wish August was here now because I'm ready to go. And um, like I said, for the audience listening, it really is. I know when you think of Kennewick, you think of uh, a dump. I mean, I know that's where Russell lives, It's and it is a dump. <laughs> but the International Bigfoot Conference is hands down. <laughs> we have like, we have Russell on video. Woody, Woody and I both just looked over, and his mouth was like on the floor. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's I'm just joking about Kennewick. Um, the International Bigfoot Conference, though, like I said, hands down, Awesome, awesome. <laughs> He's flipping us off. Yeah, he is. <laughs> it's a good time. And you I know what? The thing, the thing about it is, too, is, is you meet a whole bunch of people that we all have kind of one thing in common, and you have the camaraderie behind it. Uh, and you learn a lot of different things about a lot of different people that you didn't know. You know, I mean, like Russell, I've learned stuff about you. I've learned stuff about other people that I've met there. And, and it's really about just, uh, you know, talking to the other people and sharing experiences is really what it's all about. And, and you can see it on people's faces, too, as yeah. they come by. They're so excited to see Wes, and they're so excited to see different indiv- individuals. And Lyle Blackburn, he was he was across from us last year. Yeah, he was the, a cool guy. Yeah. And he was a really cool guy, and, and the people that came and saw him. So, it, And through him, we even met several different people. So it's it's just a matter of everybody coming together. And really, it's a great event. And if you don't it show is- up, it's it, you're missing out. You're missing out. Yeah. Yeah, and you're right, Woody. That's a cool part. You know, the speakers are cool. It's cool to go and be entertained mm-hmm. and have the speakers show stuff. But just walking around and just talking to people. Yeah. You know, there's no anywhere else on the planet if you say, hey, I want to, you want to talk. No one judges anybody. No, no, you know not at I mean? all. Yeah. yeah, people walk up and they'll tell you their encounter or whatever. And yeah. it's just a cool, unique environment. It's a good vibe. It's a very good vibe, man. Yep. And I'm looking, it might be the alcohol talking, but yeah, it's a great vibe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, yeah. it is. It, it's awesome. I loved it and I can't wait to go again. Yeah. Is there anything you guys need from me? Just bring your, bring your checkbook. Yeah. Bring your money. No, no, I'll bring cash. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think we got it covered, man. I'm just excited to come. Yeah. If you look at our, I, I just pulled up my website and it just kind of cracks me up when you were talking about Lyle Blackburn and, and uh, the first four speakers, all four have cowboy hats on. That's that's kind of funny. But to have Lyle Blackburn and Ken Gearhart in the same room is going to be fun because the, sometimes people get them mixed up for some 
some reason when they're separate besides the yeah. United States. So. <laughs> you, know, you know, before we go, I got one thing to say about that. One thing that really kind of touched me on the event that we were at last, uh, last time we were there was the children. Yeah. Like, uh, to see the kids come up and be so involved in what was going on and uh, they were so in, like, wanting to shake Wes's hand, bringing him pictures, bringing us pictures, uh, photographs, drawings that they've made, sculptures and moldings of stuff yeah. that they have built, and they're so proud of it. Uh, that's really, ultimately, I would say that's what it's all about. Yeah. To me, anyways. I got one more thing, guys. Uh, and I meant to uh, throw this out there earlier. Um, like I said, um, I've got a partner that we're doing film work. And, and we did, um, we've done a few pieces already, but nothing's out yet. We will be showing, there's a documentary that we've done on Bob Gimlin, which is the 1967 version of what took place that day. Now, we cannot step back in time and go put a camera over his shoulder. So we've gotten a, uh, um, an illustrator who does animations and illustrations for us. And we put this thing together that is just really cool. That's one of the, we're putting it together in such a way that it'll be put on a network. We're not going to sell this. It's not going to be a DVD that you can go buy and everybody can own it. Um, if you're going to see it, you'll have to come to the conference to see it. And this is the uh, um, the event as it took place. It's a breakdown of them getting to Willow Creek and getting up into the hills and parking their truck and taking out the horses and doing their research. And then when they actually had that sighting, and the the build up, and then then trying to get back off the mountain with the uh, the rainstorm, and there's so much more to the story that you'll see at this film that you don't really catch when you talk to Bob. And we've we've taken uh, weeks and weeks of just interviewing poor Bob in a green room and just letting him just say it and say it and say it again and again. And we pieced together all the little details, all the little tiny things, the year of the truck, what color it was, how he built the camper on the back, the horses, the, the saddlebags. The, uh, there's just so much. That's a film that we're actually going to show is this thing that you won't get anywhere else on the planet until it goes to a network. And for Bob Gimlin, this man has paid his dues. He's had 50 years of listening to good times, bad times, but many of those years up till. 2003 were ridicule and it was very very difficult for him so when this film is finished and we are able and and we've got uh the only place it'll be available is on a network when that network gets hold of that film and it sells that's bob's first official real payday and we're not going to settle for anything small for bob this is this is his this what is he's had coming to him and i've been so excited to actually when we sit down and, and uh, hammer out our deal with either Animal Planet, Discovery Channel, Netflix, I don't. It, it's Gary's very, very well versed in these these kind of negotiations. But when we sit down in that room, Bob is going to be in that room, and I cannot wait to see the excitement on his face when we do this. So this is this is something that is just really a tribute to Bob. Uh, you'll get to to see this this piece of work that we've been working on for about a year and a half. By the time you see it. We showed a little piece of it in Nebraska. It was about a 30% complete version of it. We've got a long ways to go. And by September, it's going to be almost complete, if, if not complete. Well, we need many more illustrations, so it'll be, it'll be well along, but definitely worth seeing. Yeah, I can't wait it'll, to see that. I've been yeah. seeing portions of it online, and I can't wait to see it. Go ahead, Russell. Oh, let me cut you off. It's neat. It's a really, really neat. And the thing is, when you're seeing it online, you're not hearing the him in the background talking about it. And you're not hearing the music that we put to it, and, and you're not seeing that some of the illustrations we've got. It's just really neat. But uh, tailgating on that comment with Bob's film, one of the things that I've mentioned a couple times in some of my email blasts, and I need to find a way to put it on my International Bigfoot Conference uh, Facebook page, is I'm going to do. We're going to do a. Um, uh, what do you call it, a uh, casting call. We're going to do a few of them throughout the year, but we're looking for a couple of individuals. Now, for Pixelsoft Films, Gary does high-end commercial work anyway here in the local area, and he's looking for a few people. But for the film that Gary and I are doing with Bob, which is a separate film than what you guys will see in September, is, um, is also a Bigfoot-related film, and we're looking for a couple key role models for or key role 
players for this film. And uh, we're actually going to do a bit of a casting call there and get people that are interested in it. And we have rooms where we can just set up a camera and say, look, um, here's a little something. Give me your interpretation of this. And we get to see, let somebody be their own personality. So there'll be a bit of a casting call going on there at this conference, too. So there's kind of like for re for reenactments. Is that what you're talking about, Russell? Yeah, the, the film that we we're going to do is the animated film that we're doing right now is animated. But we're doing a full length feature film of and it, this is the this is the, the, the fun part of this film. There's if you figure you got a 90 minute film, there's only going to be about 15 minutes of uh, 15 to 20 minutes of Bob and Roger in Bluff Creek and seeing their their this thing play out. The rest of it is the, the gem of a story I've gotten from Bob ahead of time and behind. And it's a little bit of Bob's life before this incident took place and the fallout after and kind of bring you to current date. I need people that can actually bring Bob's personality to the a screen. So we're going yeah. to actually do a casting call for um, different personalities and just kind of see what we can come up with because this, this film is happening. Well, cool. I can't wait to see the, the animated one. And um, if you, you, you know, Russell, you're always welcome on the show. If you want to come on and, and ask for when it comes, it comes time, if you want to ask for uh, people to come on and, and, or if there's anything I can do to help you, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'm, I'm more than willing to help you. I on sure there. appreciate it. I think, I think I'm going to give you a call in a week or two and see if we can not uh, jump back on here and talk to you a little bit. And um, I'm going to have Bob sitting beside me. I'd like to let him because he's he's been he's been stuck in the middle of all of this, and he's hadn't <laughs> he's having a blast. Yeah, it's, it's almost like his second childhood. He's his his wife has called me a couple times just this last week. She said, "You know, he's like a a kid again. You're you're bringing him. You're you put new life into this guy." And she said, "I didn't think it was there." And uh, Bob is awesome. absolutely loving it. I took him, um, a, a quick side note, we went to um, Cincinnati for a big major conference there. And it was not a big Bigfoot conference. It was a, a horror hound. And they had um, quite a few celebrities there uh, from uh, Gardens of the, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy um, and the Dexter series. They had uh, David Arquette and... Oh, I, I'm not really good with names of all these celebrities, but there were just so many celebrities at Horror Hound, and they brought him in um, as a celebrity, not as a Bigfoot guy, but just as a Bigfoot guy, but a celebrity Bigfoot guy. And it was amazing. Some of the celebrities, uh, David Arquette left his table to come over and shake hands and meet Bob. It's amazing how many of these people look at Bob and look up to him, and Bob yeah, is finally cool. starting to find his place in and really how important he is to us. So That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, the That's Bigfoot awesome. world loves him. He's always going to have the Bigfoot world, but I don't think he ever realized that he made an impact on everybody. It's yeah. not just us. There are other people that just that that um are just love to meet him and it was neat to see him uh shoulder to shoulder with these celebrities because that's to me that's who he is. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, for the audience out there, if you go to the internationalbigfootconference.com, uh, get your tickets. Can't wait to see you out there, Russell, uh, Woody, Bob, and all you listeners. Russell, thanks for coming on. Wes, Woody, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate that. Good to talk to you, Russell. You guys have a great night. Okay, thank you for your call. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Definitely go to the internationalbigfootconference.com and get your tickets. I hope to see you out there. Let's really jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Scott to the show. And Scott actually had an encounter out there in California. Uh, Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I'm really excited to talk to you, Scott. I know your encounter took place in 2000, back in 2011 in California. If you would, would you kind of start from the beginning and, and just kind of walk us into this encounter? What did you see? Sure. Um, well, like I said, back in 2010, 2011, um, I was relocating uh, from St. Louis out to the coast, uh, Sonoma County, specifically the Russian River region um, there by the coast. I had a friend of mine who was going to let me uh, uh, stay on his couch while I found work in a place like that. 
And uh, so after a while, I finally got my own place. Um, it was really cheap, 400 bucks a month uh, in Sonoma County. That can't be beat. It was just on a church retreat in a town called Casadero, California, which is really close to the coast by Jenner at the mouth of the Russian River. And the Casadero is uh, really thickly wooded, um, so much so that I don't think the temperatures ever got above 70 degrees. Uh, sunlight had a hard time going through the canopy. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, the set and setting. Um, it was always rainy there, always cool and moist. And I had to, I was on a church retreat property and I was just kind of maintaining everything. Part of the, part of the agreement, part of maintaining was, you know, if you know anything about reds, big redwoods, they drop limbs, you know, after rains and winds. And these limbs can be like six inches in diameter, 12 feet long. So doing, picking up tree debris was, you know, part of the agreement, a daily chore almost. So um, after living there a while, they said that if you start seeing deer, uh, well, yeah, if you start seeing deer in the redwoods and around Austin Creek, uh, so you might want to put your pets in because sometimes the other predators would follow the deer in um, and they would seek refuge from the heat, you know, it'd be 95 degrees and they'd go into calves and get a cool drink and kind of ride out the rough weather. But other than that, there really wasn't any any life in the woods because there wasn't much vegetation that could grow there without any, all that sunlight. So, uh, you know, after about a month or so of staying here, I was out doing my morning chores, picking up limbs, and there was a little group of redwoods, um, not too awful big, and they were growing out of this this central area, you know, like a little mound. And I was getting close to it, and I, I had my eyes down on the ground, and I was picking up these limbs, and out of my periphery, I just noticed there was something else there, and, you know, my mind put together, that's a leg. And... So I just kind of like looked up and there was the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot, and I was looking up and I'm 6'2". He might have been a foot off the ground, off of my elevation on the mound, but he was still a good, I'd say, four feet above my head. And he was just looking down and I just had a moment to look at his face and I was just, I just turned around dropped what I was doing, and I know the only thing that went through my head was, I'm not supposed to be here. I need to just get away and act like nothing happened. You know, and as I was walking away, I just had this, you know, I was kind of expecting this feeling like something's going to hit me from behind or get me, but it was more of, I'm just, I just tried to put off that thought, that vibe. I know I'm not supposed to be here. I'm going away. And I went into my cabin and just kind of sat down and just to contemplate what just happened. And during that time, right before that, and especially when I went back into the cabin, the woods were really full of bird noises. Um, lots of little singing, little whistles and, and, you know, bird noises like that. And I thought it was unusual at the time. And as I was thinking about it, I heard that and some movement and I figured that that's the way that the, I think it was a family of Bigfoot or a group and they were passing through and they were just, that's how they communicated with each other. And I think that was the big leader or the scout. You know, I think they kind of knew that I was there and they knew that I didn't pose a threat and he just wanted to make sure, you know, he just, I don't know if he was projecting thoughts or a vibe into my head and maybe just think that I'm not supposed to be here, but he did his job as a leader. And I think that, that they have that in them. So let me and, ask you the, the bird singing, that noise that you heard, was it not birds? Is that what you're saying? I, I, that's what I think, because I've, I've never heard that amount or, you know, or that quality of tone in the woods. Mostly it's just ravens, you know, Northern California on the coast and those reds, just ravens scavenging 
and that's about the only noise bird noise that I was familiar with. But as far as little songbirds, little whistles like that, I never, you know, came across that in the in that forest area there. And it sounded to me like they were, it was they were communicating with each other in a in a secret way, you know, not to gather attention like I've heard they can talk and things like that. Well, let's do this. Let's back up a little bit. So you're picking up wood, and this thing is right there. Uh, for the audience, can you describe what you saw? Well, yeah, it had. Uh, I, I noticed it had a darker foot. Um, I, I think that was its skin color. Its natural skin color was uh, a, a darker color, like that, kind of like you know, not necessarily black, but. It looked like, you know, if you were to rub charcoal on your skin or something like that. Um, the hair on its leg was uh, kind of, I'd say, I'd call it shaggy. At most part, its whole body was, was kind of like the four to six inch shaggy hair. And it was kind of a brownish rust color. It fit in just perfectly with like the, the barks of the, of the trees around it and with the ferns that, you know, you, you really, you, you didn't see it. You didn't see it until you were on top of it, you know, and I was about three foot away from it. That's really close. What, did, what was the face like? Uh, the face was, it was kind of like, you know, kind of a hobo ish, um, you know, with, it had like really, uh, it's cheekbones were high and wide um, its eyes were just very dark. Um, it looked like it had, uh, I didn't see, you know, the shape of its head over its forehead because it was that close and that high above me. But I just, I saw its face looking down. It had darker skin face with the, um, with kind of like hair on the sides of his cheeks and on top of his head, but there wasn't a lot of hair in his face. Um, I saw, you know, ears on the side of his head uh, is very wide and very deep chested. I didn't get to see his hands. Um, I just, you know, it was that, that view looking up, you know, on a, on a, on a man's chest, basically to see his face. And that's how I would describe him. And just, you know, very, very, just a massive body in, in, in this group of trees. Would you say it looked more human like? Would you say it looked more Definitely. No, it was it was more human like. Um yeah, I mean he had like he didn't have the the flat pushed in flared nostril look. He had a prominence of a nose. Um the wide and high set cheekbones instead of a muzzle quality. His chin came out like a like a like a human and you know it was just like i mean you could see the ears and that and and another unusual thing i guess you would say is i didn't have any kind of the smell the 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 horrible smell that is pretty much reported didn't have that no smell at all not even not even after after the fact i didn't have a scent did the, i don't know yeah and, just my experience with it yeah, no, no, and and the smell isn't reported that often. Um, it is reported, but not as often as you would think. Um, I want to ask you: did did the facial expressions change, or did it was it just glaring at you? No, it was it was its eyes were just it didn't blink. It was just a stare, a black black eyed stare, and it was uh, you know the the eyes were really intimidating just to see. You know, I didn't see any white in the eye. Um, it was just a very dark eye. And, you know, I didn't see his... I, I, and I, then again, I just glanced at his face. It, it was as soon as I made eye contact, it was shocking. It was just... It, it set my mind, you know, in a place. And, you know, it was just... Uh, it, it, it jolts you. Immediately just looked away. Yeah. And... Um, I didn't know what would, you know, I, I just figured I just needed to get away. And that's the only thing that was on my mind at that point. Yeah, I don't blame you. I would imagine it's a little bit of a brain jolt, you know, like you were saying, a little bit of, a, you know, what's going on here? What am I looking at type situation? Yeah. I almost wonder if they had seen you pick up 
basically cleaned the place up and had been watching you for a while. And so when you came up on it, you were doing what, you know, you weren't hunting, you weren't really making noise, you weren't yeah. out there camping, you were picking stuff up. And I almost wonder if that's why it just kind of stood there and looked at you It realized, you know, I'd seen, it makes me wonder if they had seen you before, I guess is what I'm trying to say, and seen your behavior before right. of picking up wood. Sure. You know, uh, you scout an area, you know, beforehand, and I don't know if I caught, if I just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, or if, if he knew that, you know, I would use, I would be in and out real quick and he knew my behavior that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm real curious about that. If they had been watching you for a while and had seen what you were doing and kind of knew your behavior, knew your routine. Um, it's odd for him to come out in the open like that. Uh, what did you, uh, did you ever see them again after this? No, no, never, never had a, 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 another sighting, never heard those bird calls ever again. Uh, never had another Bigfoot experience since, but immediately after, you know, I, w I remember drawing that face, you know, and drawing that, what I saw several times. And, uh, ever since then I've been, I've always, uh, you know, tried to find out more, you know, um, l looked for Bigfoot stories and encounter stories, uh, on YouTube and the internet. Um, just always wanted to find out more information. And um, I've heard a lot of really, really intelligent theories on their existence and why they, they're not, you know, um, officially brought out by, by science, by whoever knows, you know, that they are around. You know, I, I'm just learning more about its behavior and, and frankly, just enjoying the stories, you know, love getting scared at the mi in the middle of the night, too. I hear you. And it's, you know, it's a fascinating account, especially since it's reaction to you, how it didn't really, it didn't seem like from hearing your encounter, and, and I could be wrong, but, and you'll have to tell me, but it sounds like it didn't really strike you with fear in the sense that the fear was just, what is this? It's big. I'm looking up at it. But it's not like the creature came after you or growled at you or made any sort of gestures towards you. It was just more or less just seeing it. You didn't? Did you get the sense it was going to hurt you? No, I didn't. I, I kind of half expected it to happen, but it really wasn't uh, really a fear. It was just a bunch of thoughts on it running through my mind. And that was just, you know, wow, what if this thing would hurt me? It would hammer me in like a nail. You know, but no, I mean, even when I was in my cabin, I didn't have any fear that it was going to come in after me or ever since then, I didn't have any fear of being out in the woods, in those same woods. It was just, it was a moment. And uh, uh, yeah, I appreciate it too. It's a little eye opening when you, when you actually see them. Um, I want to ask you though, Scott, what, what do you think Sasquatch is? What's your honest opinion? I think it's a... Uh, just a North American, you know, well, worldwide species, you know, um, the hide and seek champion. And because I've heard the theory that it, you know, of there was Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, Neanderthal, and other species of human at one time. And every time Homo sapiens came into contact with one, it would wipe it out. We wiped out the Neanderthals, we wiped out the Cro Magnons, and I think this one just knew overseeing this and having them slaughtered too, that your Eastern Europeans or European type people, homo sapiens were just uh, non-tolerant of any other kind of creature like it. It was just a, um, I guess a competitive thing that would happen. And I, and, and so it would, you know, yeah, that was just part of its life is just stay out of our way. Yeah, and, and, you, and um, you could be right. It almost feels like we've run into these things before in the past, like it's in our DNA, you know what I mean? Well, not only, you know, as another creature, but, I mean, you, you see, I've seen stories of cave paintings from Native Americans, um, from all tribes across the world have stories of these, you know, stories of it living together with people. Um, with good 
you know, outcomes and bad. But since since we've taken over this North America, we've wiped wiped out a lot of things, and I think it's all that, and it just you know that's the way they survive. They just stay in these big thickets and they work at night, and they just stay out of our way. I think they they still have those senses that we may have lost, you know, um, sense of you know being able to feel the energy those six senses that that I think everybody had that we've just lost because of cell phones and transportation and, and all that. Yeah, I could, I agree with you. I think that they definitely have it. I think we've lost a lot of that. And you really start to notice that if you've ever get a chance, if you ever, um, I, and I used to notice this after um, hunting after about a week of being out there and I'm talking no cell phones, no nothing, you start to hear better. You start to smell better. It's a very strange, uh, strange thing that happens when you're out there, uh, because when you first step foot in the woods, man, you can't hear anything. You can't really smell anything. It sounds odd, but yeah. I'm telling you, after a week of being out there, no cell phones, no nothing, you'll notice you, you're you're smelling. Your sense of smell goes up. Almost your vision gets better. Um, you know what I mean? It doesn't get better, but your senses you you start to. Um, change with your environment and i think you're right we have lost that over time yeah yeah you washed off that city world you know uh and you just kind of fine-tune get it all out of your system and then you can kind of tune in yeah and and i think it's fascinating too how the creatures never you never saw them again and they didn't bother you it's not like they came up to the cabin or messed with your wood pile or uh, you might be right maybe they were just kind of passing through Uh, it makes you wonder i was only yeah, I was only at that Cavs cabin for uh, for like a year. After my lease was up after a year, I moved back into the Guerneville area. It's fascinating. It makes me wonder if they had seen you. But anyway, Scott, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate you being here. And thank you very much, Wes. Uh, I'll continue to listen, and uh, I appreciate it. Appreciate you letting me share this experience. Well, next up, I want to welcome uh, Marianne to the show. Marianne, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you being here. No, you're very welcome. I'm and if glad you, to be here. Yeah, no, I'm glad to have you on. Um, if you would, I know you grew up on a, on a property your family owned for over 200 years, what we were just talking about uh, before I brought you on. Um, did you, before you walk us into your encounter, did you ever hear anything on that property? Did anyone else ever notice anything going on? and around that property prior to the sighting? Um, I I used to sit on the back deck at night. Well, I still do. And you could hear wood knocks. And every once in a while, you would hear whoops. But as far as really seeing one, I never saw one until about, oh, I guess it's been about 15, 20 years ago. And I want to ask you, when you heard the whoops and you heard the, you know, these noises, what did you think was going on around the property? Or did you know? Well, I knew it was something, Uh, and I wasn't sure what kind of an animal it was, and I had heard about Bigfoot all my life. So this was not something that I did not know about. And some of the other farmers, they would mention, you know, seeing it and and stuff, but I never did, like I said, until about 15, 20 years ago. Well, if you would, would you walk us into your sighting? Kind of tell us what you were out doing and... And just walk us into it. What did you see? Well, I was up on the ridge, and there is a blacktop road up there. See, around here, um, there are a lot of hills and stuff. People are surprised that there's hills like there are in this area. And our fields are kind of spread out a little bit. So we had a couple fields up on the ridge. So I was going up there to kind of check on things. And I was on the blacktop road up there, and this property is bordered by the largest land state in the state, or uh, park in the state. So I was coming up, and I was behind this, the state park almost to the entrance, and I was headed, oh, I uh, east. But anyway, this huge creature jumped the fence on my right, and it had come out of the state park. 
and it just stood in the middle of the road, just stood there. It didn't make a move toward me or anything, and we just, I, I had to slam on my brakes because if I had not done that, I would have hit it. And I couldn't have been more than 15, 20 feet from it, if that. I don't even think I was that far away from it. And we stood there and we locked eyes. I just, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Because like I said, I had lived out here all of my life. And I had heard the stories and, and such, but I had never seen one. And I mean, this thing, it just stood right in the middle of the road. It had just, we had to have locked eyes for a full minute maybe a little bit longer. It never made a move toward me. It never moved. And finally, it took off and went down the left side of the road. And there was a big hill there and a lot of trees. You know, I mean, there's a lot of forest around here. And so I tried to see where it was going, and it was like the thing disappeared. I don't know where it went down there. So I just, I locked my doors, (laughs) pulled up the window on my truck, turned around and I came home and told my mom what I'd seen. And she never said a word to me. She just nodded and went on about her business. So that kind of made me think that, hey, she has seen this thing. She had just never talked about it. Yeah, that's fascinating. I actually want to come back to that. But as you're sitting in your car and you're looking at this, let's say the term Sasquatch doesn't exist. When you say Bigfoot, no one knows. No one has a clue what you're talking about. How would you describe what you saw to someone who has no idea what Bigfoot is? Oh, this thing was huge. It had to have been seven, seven and a half feet tall. It had this protruding forehead with white set eyes. It had this dark brownish hair all over its body except on its face. And and its shoulders were at least three feet across. I mean, this thing was huge. It, it, it resembled an ape. The only way I could describe it is it, re- it resembled an ape. It had like its arms looked like it was, they were normal from like the shoulder to the elbow. But from the elbow down to its hands, they were extremely long. It had a broad nose. I don't know what kind of teeth it had. It never opened its mouth. It just, like I said, it stood there and looked at me. At the time, I did have the window on my truck down, and I, it, there was a slight breeze out, and it, the breeze was coming from, from the direction that this thing stood, and it smelled like it had a real, real bad body odor. I, that's, that's the only way I can explain that. It was muscular like at the chest, and... I don't know, it was like it kind of tapered down a little bit, you know, when it got to the hips and the, and, and, and the legs. And it had these huge hands. And I can't believe I even saw that much of it because I was just locked on its eyes. And its eyes were, were dark. I didn't see any white in its eyes at all. But that could have been the time of day that I, that I saw it. I can imagine just sitting there looking at this saying it's looking at you. Did the did the facial expression change at all? Never changed. Never changed. It matter of fact, I got the feeling that it was as surprised to see me as I was to see it. Now is this daytime? Is this nighttime, Marion? Well, it was evening time. And the sun was low in the sky. I mean, the sun was still out, but it was setting. And the sun was behind me. So I wasn't, my vision wasn't too impaired by, you know, by sunlight or anything. But it, it, it was in the east time, like I said. And, and the sun was still in the sky. So there was plenty of light to see this thing. Yeah, and I always wonder on in situations like this, and you, you do hear a lot of encounters like this, and it always makes me wonder what's going on in the creature's mind, uh, because you know it heard you coming. I mean, you know it heard the car coming, and they tend to yeah. do this. They tend to, like, walk out, stop, look at people, and then make their way um, across the road and... It just makes you wonder why they do that. Why not just wait? You know, Sasquatch is supposed to be this intelligent creature. Well, you rarely do you, will you ever see a cougar do that. I Rarely will you ever see a bear do that. It makes you wonder why. 
Why, why wouldn't it just wait for you to go by? You know what I mean? Exactly. Because uh, my truck isn't exactly quiet. You know, I was in one of the older trucks, and it's, it's, it's loud, you know, being out here. We don't worry about putting a new muffler on them or anything like that. You know, I mean, this, this truck was, was uh, uh, very loud. So there was no way that it couldn't have heard it. Yeah, and so you you think this thing looked more, from what you saw, it reminded you more of an ape than a human, more of a primate kind yeah. of an animal look. Yeah, and that's exactly what I thought at the time. You know, I, it, it, it just reminded me of a huge gorilla that was standing upright. How was it, what, did it look more, I, mean, I realize that we've all seen the patterson Gimlin film, when you were looking at this thing compared to like Patty, um, what were some of the differences? I don't know. There were a lot of there, there were a lot of similarities to it. I mean, I'm going to assume this thing was a male because I didn't see any breath like like that one in the Patterson film. I, I the one in the Patterson film, if you really look at it, he's it's kind of slumped over a little bit. I mean, this thing looked like it was standing straight up. It, it I I didn't see that much difference in them it basically looked the same i think the one in the patterson film though to me of course i you know i didn't look at it that close but it's like the one in the patterson film had more hair on its face than this one had i mean this one didn't have any hair on its face yeah it's fascinating especially i think most people want this type of encounter marianne where you're in your car it's crossing the road you're going to go on your way there's really no, like you said earlier, it didn't charge at you. It didn't come after you. Um, no, it did, and did it didn't. Not. It didn't vocalize at all or anything. It just kind of stared you down, and then it did not vo- It did not vocalize at, uh, at all. It. It didn't. This thing didn't make a sound, except when it jumped over the fence. I heard it when it landed, and it, it just right out there in the middle of the road. It's just like I said, you know, this thing looked at me like it was just as surprised to see me as I was to see it. That was the last thing in the world I expected to run into up there. And it's interesting, too, about the smell, Marianne. You know, a lot of times I think the smell is something they put off in the sense that, I mean, I think a lot of times when you hear people talking about the smell, it's situations like this where they're caught off guard or they surprise it or... Um, a lot of times people will report the, the smell. When they're not caught off guard, rarely will you ever hear someone talking about the smell. So you could have been right. You know, your impression with what you're saying, it, it was just a sort of shock to see you as you were of it. That makes me wonder a little bit about the smell. Um, and I think in situations like that, they do give off this smell. For the audience, can you describe the smell? Well, it's like I said, it was it was kind of like... Um really bad body odor, you know, like you'd been in a locker room or something, or like someone hadn't had a bath in a while. That, that's, that was my first thought when I smelled that. And like I said, it was just a slight breeze. I didn't get a real big whiff or anything, but I could still smell it. And it was, it, it was just, just a body odor like smell. Yeah. I mean, it, I've heard people say, well, they smell like rotten eggs and they smell like this, you know, or sulfur or something. You know, that's not the impression I got. The first thing that came to my mind was a really bad body odor, like being in a locker room after a big game or something. And I think it's fascinating. You go home, tell your mom, and she just kind of looks at you like, mm-hmm, okay. And then she goes mm-hmm. on to her... And there's a- her, uh, you know, what she was doing. Do you, do you think she saw one? I mean, did you ever get a chance to tell her or ask her later in life? Well, I asked her a couple times, and she never really said anything. It, it's almost like, you know, out of mind, out of, you know, out of sight. It, it's, but, the, but I've heard the farmers talk about it. As a matter of fact, they refer to it as Barney. And every once in a while you'll hear them, well, Barney was active today. You know, and I and I'd heard this expression for years and years, and uh, but I just had the feeling with the way my mom looked at me, and she just nodded, and then she went about her business. I think she was cooking or something at the time. I don't even remember. Uh, it. I just got the impression that she had seen it, and I had mentioned something to my dad about it, 
And all my dad said was, well, you got to be careful when you go up in those woods. As a kid, I played in those woods. Yeah, it's it's interesting you know, we, when you get that reaction, you know, from your parents. It's like, <laughs> what did they know? You know what I mean? I know, exactly. Exactly. The thing of it is, around here, sightings become so common, nobody even mentions them hardly anymore. Every once in a while, you might hear one, somebody say something, but they don't really mention it anymore. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact they don't want people coming down here, coming on their property, because we don't even allow people to hunt down here unless we know them. Yeah, no, I understand. Did it did it ever come up to the home, or did you guys ever have any problems with the creature? I know you had found footprints, I think, when there was a drought or a flooding or something, wasn't there? Uh, normally, we've never been bothered with them coming to our homes or bothering our livestock or anything, but in 2015, in December of 2015, we had a really bad flood down here, and it got to the point to where the water was coming up to the farm, so my mother and I decided that uh, we were going to go into town and stay in town, and our farmhand stayed down there in, in that area. Uh, because his house sat where the floodwaters weren't going to get to it. And somebody had to take care of the property. So he called me one day, and it, it was kind of funny because he had never seen it before either. Well, about three weeks to a month, I would say, when the waters receded enough that if we wanted to, we could have gone back down there, but we decided to just go ahead and spend the winter in town. Well, he called up, and he was really excited. He had seen it, and he said that it was crossing the pasture, and this particular pasture that it was crossing was close to the house. So I decided, well, I'm going to go down there and check things out because I hadn't been down there for a while. So him and I went to the house, and it had just snowed the night before, and there wasn't much snow on the ground, just a couple inches, you know, if that. But we, you know, checked everything out, and we went down to the house, and there were footprints these big footprints, they had to have been about 15 inches long. And they were going around the house. You could see where it come out of the out of the holler. It had come up, it had gone around the house, and it looked like it had stopped and looked in at least four of the windows. Now, that's the only time I ever knew or even heard of one coming up to one of our homes. But I think that, and I know this is probably going to sound silly, but I think the reason it did that was because I think these things know who belongs in this area and who don't. And we hadn't been there for a while, and I, my impression was it was coming down to check on us to see where we were at. It's hard to say. You, you hear of them doing that, though, and, and checking properties out. I know on Friday night show, um, a family went into a cabin, and it was a hunting cabin, and no one had been there for many years, and all of a sudden this family shows up. They they're just basically going hunting or camping. Uh, they weren't even there to hunt; they were just there to camp. And they had a hellish night of this thing, just going around hitting the side of the cabin. And and it, going back to your story, though, it it does make you wonder if maybe it had noticed you guys weren't there, came down to check it out, but you had never heard it that close up to the house before, had you? Before finding the prints, never. Nobody has ever reported this thing coming up to the house. Nobody has. And this particular area, I mean, we're like 13 miles from town. So we're down in a secluded little rural area. There's several farmers down here. And um, nobody has ever mentioned it coming to their house, to their barns, bothering their livestock or nothing. But there's plenty of deer down here. So... I mean, their food supply, you know, plus pawpaw trees and, and stuff. And there's there's plenty of food out there for them. So I I just figure that, you know, there was no need for them to come down to, you know, right to the farms. Every once in a while, you know, somebody would see one crossing a field or crossing, you know, going along the wood line or down by the river or something like that, but never to to our homes. I wonder why the farmers named it Barney. 
If that was just kind of co- because, code for Sasquatch I, or what? I, I, I guess they figured they had to give it a name, is, is what I figure. And I don't even know who did that, because we're a pretty tight-knit com- little community down here. And uh, there's only, uh, there's one gas station that sits out in the middle of nowhere, and you can go in there and sit and have a cup of coffee and stuff, you know. And every once in a while, the farmers will get, you know, gathered down there and talk about things. And every once in a while, they'll mention Barney. Somebody just gave it the name Barney. But there's more than one of them down here because I can sit on the back deck and I'll hear a wood knock come from one direction and then uh, not long after that, I'll hear a wood knock come from another direction. And it's the same way with the whoops. You hear them from in one direction and then one of them will answer in another direction. And we figure we probably got I don't know, maybe three or four of them, at least two of them living down here. And with the state park, and like I said, it's the largest land park in the state. We, we've we got that, plus all these farmers and all these hills and these woods. I mean, there are literally thousands of acres of, of forest down here. One of the farmers figured that on the back of our property, there is an old limestone quarry. Because like I said, this farm is over 200 years old. And when they used to blast out there, you know how some of the rocks would, and they kind of, it's almost like they'd fall and there'd be a little shelter, like, you know, under the rocks and stuff. Right. One of the farmers thinks that maybe they're living around that. Because nobody even goes up to that quarry anymore. There's no reason to. And there are a few caves up there. Really makes you wonder, what do you think that they are, Marianne? What's your honest opinion? What do you think that these creatures are? My honest opinion is that they're animals. They're just ape-like animals, and I don't even know if they're apes or not. I think they're intelligent animals, but I think they're animals nonetheless. I, I don't think they're interdimensional beings. I've heard that theory. I don't think they come from UFOs. I've heard that theory. I just think that they're animals, and I think that there's got to be a bunch of them because literally every state but Hawaii has some sort of report on them. Yeah, don't you find it a little odd, though, we can't catch up with them? Well, yes, I do. I do, but I think they're smart enough, really, to stay away from us. It's like the one down around here. I think that, I don't know if I should say this or not because it makes me sound silly, but I I think that they're used to us down here. I think they know who belongs in this area, and we don't bother them. We don't go out hunting them. We we just don't bother them. And every once in a while, a hunter will say something about catching a glimpse of one or, or seeing one, and it just, it walks away from them. We've never had any, no, I'm not saying they're not dangerous, okay? But we have never, there's never been a report of attacking anyone down here. I understand what you're saying. And I don't think it's that odd to think what you were thinking, that they know everyone. You know, it's like I just had Scott on the show, and Scott was, you know, he would go out and have to clean up. He lived in a rental. He'd have to clean up the property and go out and pick up wood and fallen tree limbs, and that was part of the deal. And so he would go out there every day and do it. Well, when he came across a Sasquatch, it just looked at him. Um, And it made me wonder if it had seen him before and it kind of knew what his routine was and really knew he wasn't a hunter. It knew, and that's just me speculating, which means nothing. You know, my two cents means nothing, but it makes you wonder if it's seen the behavior before, you know, like in your guys' situation, you know, the, the farmers are calling it Barney and they're giving it a name. Obviously, they're not trying to kill this thing. Um, and they're not really messing with this thing. It kind of seems like a live and let, let live type situation that you're in down there. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's a live and let live. And, you know, it, it, if it's not bothering us, if it's not causing any danger to us or threatening to us, let it, leave it alone. But we won't, we won't let anyone come down here on our property to hunt, hunt it. That's why we don't really talk about it too much outside of of our little community although we have mentioned it you know don't get me wrong we don't just keep you know it's not a real big secret 
because there have been reports of people that drive through the park that have seen them, you know, caught a glimpse of one. But we we don't let anyone come down here to hunt them. We don't, we don't even let them come down here to hunt deer or anything because we don't want them on our property. We we don't want we don't want to disturb them because we figure. Uh, I, and don't get me wrong, we're not complacent. I mean, when when you go out to feed your livestock, you get up before the sun comes up, and by the time you get home, the sun is down. So we we are alert as to what's going on around us. Because we not only have them, you know, we have coyotes down here, we have cougars down here, and, you know, you just, and we have black panthers down here. And I know a lot of people say those don't exist, but they do because I've seen them. So, you know, I mean, we we do pay attention to what's going on, but we have just never been bothered with them. It, it's a live and let live situation. Yeah, and I get, you know, and I can understand that. I can understand that mentality. Um, you know, if your experience with them is it was banging on the house every night, you know, and killing your dogs, killing your livestock, uh, you would have a whole different perspective of these things. But the fact that they haven't bothered you, I, I can see where you're coming from on it. Yeah, well, if it was down here banging on the house, if it was killing livestock or killing my dog, then, like you said, that's a whole new story right there. That's a whole new situation. But they don't do that. My dog will bark every once in a while. He'll look up toward the tree line, and he'll stand there, and he'll bark, but he never makes a move toward it. And we have had reports of dogs being killed, but we don't think it's them. We think it's probably a cougar or or something. It, it's just probably the manner in which the dog was killed. But we just, nobody's missing livestock. Nobody is... Uh, when the winters get real bad, we get the coyotes will come down to the farm. More than once, I have stood out in the dark and fired a shotgun in the air to get uh, the coyotes off. But those are the only only predators that we have really had problems with, and that's usually in the winter time when the winters get so bad that they just it drives them out of the hills down to the farms for food. Well, I'm glad it's kind of a live and let live type situation out there on the property. And it, it's a fascinating account. I really do appreciate you coming on and, and sharing it. And you'll have to keep me up to date. Let me know if anything new happens out there at that property. Will you, Marion? Oh, I will. And and to this day, when I go up to those fields up on the ridge, I really pay attention to see what's going on up there. Because, like I said, that was the last thing in the world I expected to run into that day. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. And I haven't had a whole lot of encounters from Illinois, so I really appreciate you coming on and and sharing it. I really enjoyed talking with you. Well, I enjoyed it, too. And I do enjoy your your show. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Marianne. And that's it for tonight, everyone. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Please check out sasquatchchronicles.com. Become a member, get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.